Okay. Little note here says I'm live. So I want to start tonight. Uh, we don't officially start till 630, which is another 10 or so minutes away. But I wanted to visit a little bit about my experience in Honduras before we start. Um, I thought I'd spoken in more churches, but it looks like I actually spoke in either four or five churches. But I did about five TV programs and three radio programs uh, to promote the big crusade. But uh, I've got one story that I want to tell you that I think is very important. So, and of course, I say four or five churches. There was three other times that I spoke in a group. It wasn't in a church where people came in. So that's probably why it feels like to me it was eight to ten churches. But in there, I noticed... Uh, something very important. I noticed the churches where there was a strong anointing, where God was really speaking to the people, where he was speaking through me in, in prophecy and things like that. The ones that knew their Bible, how do you know they knew their Bible? Because they had it with them. Um, the churches where... Okay, I see we're having trouble getting on Rumble, so I don't know. Hopefully my team will get on that. But anyway, the churches where the anointing was the most powerful was where they had their Bibles, and I could tell they knew their Bibles. And I remember speaking in one church, and there was probably a small group, probably 20, you know, maybe 25 people there. And all the time I was speaking, this one little old lady in the back row kept, you know, punching her fist <laughs> in the air. Amen, amen. Of course, she was saying it in Spanish. I don't know what she was saying, but uh, I assume it was amen. And after it was over, she came up to me and she had this little Bible and she was clutching at her hands like it was filled with gold coins. And it was all worn out. I don't mean worn out because it had been thrown around in the back of a car and, and abused for 20 years. I mean worn out because the pages were worn as I, I said, may I see that? You know, of course, I had an interpreter. And I looked at the Bible. I looked through it. And there was notes or highlights or scribble marks on most every page. I mean, this lady had been through her Bible many, many, many times. And she was the most excited about what I had to say. And I noticed this, that the more the church had the word in them, the more they knew the Bible, the more excited they were to hear the truth of God. The more anointing there was, the more powerful there was. Um, let, let me give you an example. Okay, so I went into one church, and this church had, it was the nicest church. It was the only church that air, had air conditioning, I might add. And, uh, of course, that's another issue. I mean, I'd never been in 100% humidity before. At 100% humidity, even if it's 72, you're sweating because uh, I didn't realize this, but the body is always sweating. And at 100% humidity, it, you still sweat because it doesn't evaporate. Nothing evaporates. I mean, you spill water on the floor, come back, it's still there. <laughs> it didn't evaporate unless you have air conditioning. Anyway, uh, I had a prophecy for the pastor there and for his wife and a few other people. Very powerful. Uh, it's, and because I, I, I could feel in the spirit, it wasn't just that they loved the Lord, but that they loved the Lord enough to study his word. I, I saw that Bible study. I mean, I thought this, but I mean, I actually saw that Bible study was extremely important in getting close to God. Let me say it again. Bible study was extremely important in getting close to God. So I looked at this little old lady's Bible, and it was all worn out. And I could tell the anointing was really powerful with her, even before I saw her Bible. And I would say that that's the biggest thing I noticed in uh, the differences between the churches. The churches where they, I'm talking about the congreg congregation members, where they had their Bibles. Uh, they had their notepads, they had pens or pencils and highlighters, and they came ready to read and study the Word, okay? Those kind of churches, 
had a really strong, powerful anointing. The one church that probably I would say had the least also had the least Bibles. Um, I, so I, I just I was thinking to myself before I came on today. So, Stan, why do you do a Bible study? Well, I do it for a lot of reasons, but I need it. If no one else needs it, I need it. So if I'm just here talking to myself, <laughs> that's fine. You know, it's, it's it's good for me. I need to study, and you know, doing the prophecy club and researching and things like that. I don't always get to study the Bible as much as I'd like to, but what, what I'm trying to say is our strength, a, a lot of our strength, not the only strength, but a lot of our strength in the Spirit comes because we know the Bible. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. In other words, we learn about God, we learn who He is, and you might say He learns who we are, by how much we read and study his word. So I've seen this before. People that read and study their Bible on a regular basis, and I'm not talking about just going to Bible studies. Yes, Bible studies are the best. But on their own, where, I mean, think about this. When was the last time, of course, probably <laughs> talking to people coming to a Bible study, I'll get a lot of people that would say yes, but when was the last time you actually sat down in front of your paper Bible, highlighter and pen in hand? Do you have a notepad or do you make notes on your Bible? Now, I make notes on my Bible. Um, of course, these days, you know, <laughs> I just make notes right in the electronic Bible. But what I'm trying to say is I do the Bible study because I need it. I also do it because I think that you need it. I think everybody needs it. I think that it is one of the center foundations for our Christian walk. I might add also another center foundation is the prayer closet. And that's another thing. I, I Several places I've talked about the prayer closet. Let me see how much time I got. Okay, about, okay, so when I was on TV, I only had one hour, but I had exactly an hour. A few places would let me go over. But I went through reading Revelation 13. And I showed them that a world government is rising. Out of that world government, there's going to be a man stand up, which would be the Antichrist. And he would give him, be given, he would give him, and it was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Power was given to him to continue 42 months. And God gave him a mouth speaking great things. And a lot of people would say, well, I mean, I would tell them, you know, you may be thinking, well, why would God give the devil or the Antichrist a mouth to speak great things or, or very, very bad things against him and his church and, and everything about his church? And the answer is because God sent his one and only son and gave mankind a great gift. For 2,000 years, he offered that gift, the gift of the blood of his son, the gift to have their sins washed away and to live eternally with him. And for 2,000 years, for the most part, mankind has refused that gift. They've turned their back. They don't want it. So consequently, God looked down and said, okay, you don't want my blood. You don't want my gift. You don't want for eternal life. You want the devil. Okay, so I'll give you the devil. So he's given the world the devil for the last three and a half years, 42 months. And here's what to look for. He described what he's going to look like and talked about the mark of the beast. And then I turned to talk about Israel. And then a lot of times, it was some place that I didn't on TV, but some place I was talking. Then I would talk about the prayer closet. And when I got to the prayer closet, the boy that would really show who knew their Bible. The more they knew their Bible, the more their heads were shaken. Absolutely right. You know, it's important to get on our knees. It's important to worship God. I didn't say go in there and start praying for yourself or begging or you know, give me this, give me that, give me that. You know, fix my problems. That's not prayer closet. Prayer closet is one thing. It is worshiping God. Praise is telling God who, or excuse me, praise is telling God what he does and that we love him for it. Worship is telling God who he is and that we love him for it. And real prayer closet, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
And of course, we all want the protection of God. But are we willing to come out of our world every day, get on our knees, and do praise and worship in order to get it? And that's another thing. I said, I don't go into a prayer closet to get. Say it again. I don't go into a prayer closet to get. I go into a prayer closet to give. But I've noticed that when I go into prayer closet and I worship God every day, all sorts of things get fixed. I get fixed. <laughs> Family, you know, finances, all kinds of things get fixed that I can't fix. Some of them I didn't know were broken. Some of them I didn't know were coming, but God knows. And so he just blesses those people that have a prayer closet. So anyway. Back to my point, and then we'll start the Bible study. My point is, Bible study, it's real important. It's real important. So my congratulations to you folks that are tuning into the Bible study, whether you're watching it live or watching the recording. Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Let me get rid of this, and we'll start. First of all, Lord, we say worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Because you were slain has redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and has made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you did say that wherever two or more gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Thank you for the Holy Spirit coming into our meeting. And Lord, we want to just say right now, we do not understand your word. We cannot understand your word without the Holy Spirit opening our eyes, opening our heart, helping us to understand it. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. And we ask you to show us the deep and secret things because wisdom and might are yours. You change the times and seasons. You removeth kings and setteth up kings. You giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. You reveal it the deep and secret things. You know what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with you. And Lord, we ask that you would show us the deep and secret things within your word. Help us to understand what you spoke, when you spoke or wrote it, how it ties together with us, our life, and also into the future, and the things that you want us to do to serve you. Help us to know and understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to start at Matthew 1.17. Matthew 1.17. Yes, I'm putting it up on the screen, but I encourage you to get out your Bibles. Even if they're paper Bibles, actually, I tease, but paper Bibles are great. I mean, paper, yeah, that's King James, that is. Uh, don't read the other versions, just King James. And that way you can highlight, you can make uh, notes in them and things like that. All right, so let's go on here. Okay. Matthew 117. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David under the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon and to Christ are 14 generations. Now, I know what you're going to be thinking. Wait a minute. Uh, isn't this the sort of stuff you read uh, for for coming up on um, on, on on Christmas? Uh, yes, but I want to show you some deeper th things tonight. We're going to do a study in it. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise: when his Mary and when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public, public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. Now, why did he say thou son of David? Because that's important. Because linear bloodlines are important, especially in this case. It's important because the scriptures had said that Jesus, the Messiah, would be coming from the son of David. Fear not to take unto thee, Mary, thy wife, for, the, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, 
Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took him and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, now let me say something. Other scriptures say he would be born in Bethlehem. Why? Because that's the only place on earth, if Jesus was the Messiah, and of course we know that he was, if he was the Lamb of God, and we know that he was, he had to be born in Bethlehem because that's what the scriptures say. But where he was born was also very important. He was born where the temple lambs to be sacrificed are born. Now, when those lambs are born, they're wrapped in strips of cloth. They're called swaddling, or they're to, to restrict them, because babies' fingernails are like razors. And if you've been around newborn babies, a lot of times you see scratches on their face like that, because they 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 just barely touch their skin, and they'll scratch it. Well, for a, a lamb to be a, a sacrifice, it had to be perfect. No scratches, no blemishes, no bones broken or anything like that. So we know that entire time of Jesus' death, before he was put on the cross, he never had a scratch. There was never a time he slipped and stumbled and fell on his knee and none of that, ever, because he was to be the Lamb of God. He was to be perfect. No one took his life. He laid it down. He laid it down. He took it up. So he had to be born in Bethlehem in order for him to be the Lamb of God. So while, while we read it quickly and easily, maybe we don't really understand the significance of it. So he's born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded to them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you found him, bring me word again, that I may also come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they, they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, it was a star in the sky. Well, it may have been. But stars don't move and come over an exact place. Many times in the scripture, a star, I can show you in Revelation chapter 5, I uh, saw a star fall from her, from, the, uh, from heaven to the earth and it was given him the key to the bottom of the pit. So it may have been, probably was a star. Matter of fact, I'll show you the scriptures in just a second. That a star did have to do with his birth, but when it, the star moved and came over where the baby was located, that was an angel. So the angel was showing him showing that the wise men where Jesus was. All right, now, let me let me pause here. Let me write down where I am there. I said it's going to put me up a little piece of paper so I can make notes a little faster here. All right, so I'm at... ...ten. So let's come back to Matthew 2, 10. Now let's jump to... There. So this is where it's talked about in the book of Revelation. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Take me too long to explain that, so I'll just skip on. And she, being with, cry, with child, cried to belly and birth and pain to be delivered. Now that part is talking about Jesus, or excuse me, talking about uh, the, the, the nation of Israel that is going to bring forth the, uh, the, the, the Messiah. The, the, the Christ child, and she, the woman, or what is 
Israel, and the woman was also referred to as the church, too, later. And she, being with child, with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now, here's another point. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, and there are these are astronomical signs up there, too. A great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Now, this is important. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. I believe that there's was actually, or there's going to be actually two wars in heaven. The first war in heaven took place right here. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. But there will be, not yet, but there will be another war in heaven. So it says, and his tail. Now, some people think that that is maybe T-A-L-E, but I've looked it up and it doesn't refer to a tail as in a tall tail or as in a story. But it probably fits because probably what happened here is the devil began to speak to all of the angels of heaven, telling them that God was a lie, he was a liar, and that actually the better way to do it is the way the devil wants to do it. And his lie drew a third part of the stars. In other words, a third part of the angels in heaven decided to go with Lucifer. So that was the first defeat of Lucifer. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, did cast him to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman. Now we're back to where we're talking about here. So this is Herod trying to go out and kill the baby Jesus. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour a child as soon as it was born. That's what we're reading now. And she brought forth a man child, that would be Jesus, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, what is the rod of iron? The rod of iron is referred to four times in the New Testament. All of the four times, it's all talking about the same thing. And that is those people whose names are not in the book of life, and those people that are did not receive Jesus, but they didn't take the mark of the beast either, they are what the Bible calls the nations, and they are allowed to live up to a thousand years. Or if they sin, if they sin, then a morning star judge shows up the speed of light, speed of thought, which are really faster than the speed of light, and hits them with a morning star, which is the breath out of their mouth, they fall to the ground, a pile of ashes and bones, destroying both body and soul. At the end of the thousand years, then Satan is loosed out of his, his prison. He goes out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire from God out of heaven. There it is again. The morning star, fire from God out of heaven, came down and devoured them. So they are given up to. 1,000 years to live. I know what you're saying. I never heard that before. Well, I'd never heard it before either because I don't think most people knew it until God started showing me these 30 revelations which I wrote in the book, Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy. And if you've not read that book, you are missing a major chunk of understanding Bible prophecy. Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy. You can get it at prophecyclub.com. All right, now let's continue. Okay, so let me back up. Appeared another one in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. Okay, tail to the third part of the stars of heaven. We talk about that. She brought forth a man child who to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God into his throne. So that's after Jesus crucified. Now, then from between this little dot and that little six there, there's roughly 2,000 years inserted there. And God does that several places in the scriptures because to him, time means nothing, okay? So, unto his throne. So, Jesus died and went to heaven. And the woman fled into the wilderness. The woman would be Israel, fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years. So, what it's saying is in the middle of the tribulation, when, the, when we see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, run, run for your life. And where they'll run is going to be 216 miles straight south down to the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, where I walked on it October the 8th of 2022. And there they're going to be offering sacrifices of praise, not sacrifices of animals, sacrifices of praise. On the way down, the dragon cast water out of his mouth as a flood that it might cause the woman to be carried away of the flood. 
and the earth helped the woman. The earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of its mouth. In other words, what I think is that they use scalar wave. They see these people leaving Jerusalem when they see the Antichrist commit the abomination of desolation or set on the Ark of the Covenant. They see the Antichrist set on the Ark of the Covenant. All the Christians say, whoa, 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 that's it. That's the abomination of desolation. And they leave. They don't even pack. They don't collect $200. They don't collect, they don't pass go. They leave and they leave quickly. They ran 260 miles south. But on the way down there, they fire up the scaly wave. They cause a big flood to come down in these big ravines. And I mean, these ravines are like really high. You, you can't just climb out of them. And if he sends a flood down there, that flood will wash through for several hundred miles and kill everything in those ravines. I've, I've been in those ravines. I'm, I mean, I've been down them. I've actually walked where Moses and the children of Israel walked down that ravine. I know. And so when that flood comes, that's the reason the earth opens up their mouth, swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast, cast out of her mouth. And then it goes on to say, and the woman was, uh, and, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. He went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Meaning, once he sees God is protecting them, once he sends this big flood, and these people that are Christians that are in Jerusalem that see the abomination of desolation, they're running south and the flood tries to, to swallow them, but the earth opens up, swallows the flood. The devil says, okay, God's protecting them. So then he goes back to Jerusalem to cause havoc with all the other Christians there. And that's what it's essentially saying. Now, probably hadn't heard that before either, but again, you know, go and get the book, Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy, prophecyclub.com. I'm not promoting the book. The reason I'm not ready to show you all this, so I have to just kind of do it off the top of my head. All right, now let's jump back to. Oh, I keep doing this wrong. I got to jump over here. Hang on. And I go to Matthew 2 10. Okay, here we go. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, those are valuable, but I think the gold is to provide for Joseph and Mary through perhaps many, many years, maybe even all the way up to the time his ministry started. I, I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us how much. But they instantly had plenty of money. Let's put it that way. And being warned of God of the dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the child, the young child, to destroy him. That's the scriptures we just read. When he arose, he took the young child, his mother, by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Egypt. Now, here, now, let me say something else. Dimitri, when I was driving him around in 1988, it would have been then, that would have been March of 1988, driving him around from church to church and radio or TV station to speak for, for, two, years, for two, two, two weeks, we would pa pass over a river and he'd say, What's the name of that river? Well, after two or three days of him wanting to know the name of every river we drive over in Kansas and Missouri, I finally said, okay, you want to tell me why you want to know <laughs> the name of every river we're crossing over? And so Michael, his interpreter, asked him, and he said, well, because the angel of the Lord took me and showed me a wooded area between two rivers, and he said that in, when the trouble comes, he's going to take him and many people with him to a wooded area between these two rivers where they're going to be protected during the time of great trouble. Now, obviously, he did, he said that because he didn't want to let Dimitri know he wasn't going to be there then, but it still hadn't happened. But Dimitri said, I think it if it's not here, it's someplace close to here. And of course, we're in Kansas and Missouri. My guess is it was probably the Ozarks. Now, why do I tell you the story? Because as God spoke to Joseph in the dream and told him, arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt, I believe 
that if we are close enough to the Lord, if we have that prayer closet, we're reading our Bible, we have a clean life, he is going to come to us, be it a dream, a vision, an audible voice. He's going to speak to us, and he's going to tell us where to go. All right, I'm, I'm nudged to tell you this story. So about mm, three weeks ago, maybe four, I guess about four weeks ago, we had, Leslie had one, okay, I got my Belgian Malwa, which is a real dog. <laughs> I would get in trouble if I said that around her. And she's got two Shih Tzus. Now, her little Shih Tzus are about this long. Okay, They're like eight pounds. And, of course, my my Misty Blue, Benjamin Mawa, is 85 pounds. <laughs> so, anyway, one of her Shih Tzus died. And Leslie was very upset about it. And so was I. You know, it was a very, very upsetting time. But God showed her in a vision, not a dream, a vision. The next dog showed her it would be a red and white dog. And even she said she saw this red and white puppy chasing after Ruby. That's the one that died. And Ruby turned back and said lollipop as Ruby, the, di the dog that died, looking back to, at the red and white dog, lollipop. So Leslie got online, was looking for a red and white Shih Tzu. Sure enough, she found one and she named it lollipop. So let's, the, dog, the dog, name of the new dog is Lollipop. And everybody loves the name. Of course, it's like, where did you ever come up with a name like that? Well, God gave it. Now, I say all that to say this. Prophecy Club brings a lot of very, very scary information. Uh, but I will have to say, in, in the 40 years I've been studying Bible prophecy, not me or Leslie or any of our children or any of our family I know of has ever had a bad dream about handcuffs or barbed wire or being arrested or head cut off or none of those kind of dreams. I believe that if we're close enough to the Lord, and especially if we're a watchman, if we are carrying the message of the warning, then we aren't going to be part of the judgment. Maybe that's the way to say it. My point is, the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream told him to go to Egypt to avoid the trouble. I think the same thing is going to happen to God's people. I don't think it's going to be a pre-trib rapture that's going to uh, protect people. But I do think, I know God is going to protect his own. I know it. I know God is going to protect his own. All right, let's go on. Verse 14. When he arose, he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And there was until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he diligently acquired of the wise men. So all of the children in Israel, and all of the areas around there that Herod controlled, all of the male children, two years and under, were all killed. I guess there's no question that he was of the devil, huh? But that was the devil trying to find Jesus and kill him. Then it was fulfilled, it was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in the dream to Joseph in Egypt saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Arch Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Chapter 3. And in those days, let me look over and see if I have any notes or questions here. Okay? Wow, well, okay, I'll answer this, this question. It's, it's just everything to do with the Bible. Do you think Biden is trying to force a two-state solution in in 
in this Israeli-Palestinian war? Uh, yes, <laughs> I do think he's trying to force a two-state solution. And as you recall, we have 12 different prophecies that say that if America splits Israel, God is going to sp split America. And you recall, Rick Chris Reed just had another dream just here October the 8th, where he said he saw, it said, so goes Israel, so goes America. In other words, whatever happened, whatever bad happens to Israel is going to happen to America. And he saw that, of course, the, the there's a war looming on the border right now of Israel. And so if Israel get attacked, gets attacked from the north, so will America. We're already being attacked from the south. We don't need another attack from the north. Uh, okay, another question. Why would a child have a rod of iron that he may rule with? Okay, that, that's not what he's saying. He rules with a rod of iron, meaning that in the millennium, after Jesus' return, after we are already into our eternal bodies, he's already cleansed the earth of all sin, and this is he, he's saying this not to us, we can't sin. This is the nations, those people that did not receive the mark of the beast, but they also did not take, they didn't receive Jesus either. They are the corners not harvested. They, they didn't fall into ca either category. So they are ruled with a rod of iron, meaning if you sin one time, then you are killed. That is instant judgment. The final judgment, the final, final judgment is on atonement. That's the judgment of the death. The judgment of the living is on the Feast of Trumpets. I mean, I'll, you're, you, there's really no way for me to, I, I've tried many times, no way for me to try to explain this through audio and video. And that's what the second vision showed me, that there are some things that people just cannot understand by audio and video. Some things we must read. And that's, I, I just got to send you to go to prophecyclub.com and get my book, Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy. There it lays it all out. It also has all of the charts so you can put it together. Short of that, you probably will not understand Bible prophecy. That's that's my take on it. Anyway, so let's go back to it. All right, so chapter 3, verse 1. And of those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, uh, the Lord just nudged me. Okay, I think he is saying don't back up from encouraging them to get the book. Um, it's important. I mean, I didn't write the book. I mean, I mean I'm not trying to be humble or anything. I mean, I, I didn't write the book. Uh, I'm not going to say it's on the order of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course. But I don't have that kind of wisdom. So I, I believe he just nudged me to, to tell you, yes, it's important to go and get Secret Door to understand Bible prophecy. I'll say it again. Prophecyclub.com, order the book, Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy. Go check it out. So in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. In other words, stop sinning. That's what he's saying. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leather girdle about his, his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Now why? Because God was saying, this guy is not of your world. He, is, he didn't want anything to do with your nice clothes, your nice food, you know, he's he's living off of the land. He's living off of what God sent him because he's delivering a message, a clean message from a clean body, not part of the world. That's why, let me read that again. So his raiment was camel's hair. He didn't wear the kind of clothes they did in those days. And a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat, in other words, the things he lived off of was locusts and wild honey. I'm glad we don't have to eat like that. <laughs> but the point is, God was trying to say he's clean. Then went out of Jerusalem into Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. 
But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come, have a very good friend. And he says, almost every lawyer and banker is corrupt. That's almost true, too. A, a lot of them are very corrupt. And in this case, the Pharisees and Sadducees were the church leaders. And it seems like the devil always seems to have control of the leaders, be it the church, be it the government, uh, be it the education. He's always in control. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father. For so, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up the children unto Abraham. I don't know about you, but that's bothering me. Let me close that here. There we go. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now, actually, that's a really important verse. A lot of people don't like that verse because a lot of Christians want to say, well, I accepted Jesus. I go into church. I toss in the offering as the plate passes from time to time. I mean, you know, what else do you want? I mean, I visit three times a year. I mean, just how much you want of me? Well, this is telling you how much. So he says here, now the also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Meaning, you're about to be cut down and tossed into the fire. That is the fire that burns with fire and brimstone, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which, according to Revelation 21, is the second death or soul death, flesh death and also soul death. Then he says, Therefore, every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. What's that saying? It's saying that if we don't win at least one more person to Christ, we are cut down and hewn into the fire. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I accept Jesus and I don't put anything in the plate, if I, if I don't attend church, if I don't do anything, you're, you're, you're saying that I still don't make it to heaven? Well, I didn't say it. That's what the Bible says. Read it again. Here it says, For every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Remember the story of the, of the, uh, the, the talents? One had five, one had two, one had one. And then the one that had five brought back ten. Well done. That one that had two, okay, but what happened to the one that had one? He said, thou wicked and slothful servant. Take from him the one talent that he has and give to the one that has ten. Now, that brings a question. So what is the talent? Is that the talent of singing or playing the piano or talent of, say, playing soccer? No. The one talent is the gift of eternal life. Meaning, if we don't give that gift of eternal life to at least one more person, then our gift of salvation is taken and given to him that has ten. Or our fruit, our tree is cast down and cast into the fire if we don't bring others to Christ. So like I always say, in the game of life, in the game of the kingdom, there is no bench. Everybody gets to play. No one gets to sit on the side and do nothing. So if you have not ever led someone to the Lord, you should be concerned. Now there's another one that says, another scripture that says, but uh, to one plants, the other waters, but the Lord gives the increase. So maybe maybe you're one that doesn't have a way, a gift of gap. Maybe you can't talk to people. Maybe you can't win someone to the Lord with your lips, but you can give to someone that can. That counts in my book. The way they, that's the way I see it. Meaning that even if you can't tell the gospel story, even if you can't preach or teach or something like that, but you can give and you can help a ministry to someone that can. So that's still you helping to bring people into the kingdom. In other words, everybody's responsible to help the kingdom. That's what it's saying. 
I indeed, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water and to repentance. That's the water baptism. That's John's baptism. That's the more important baptism because without that, you don't get to eternal life. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, the part that most people miss here is that third part right here. This word right here, fire. What's the fire? This is the fire. When Jesus returns on the white horse and he goes, the morning star. So when he says, I baptize you with water and repentance. John's baptism was dunking people in the name of the Lord. Name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, water to repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. How do you know if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost? Well, there are nine gifts of baptism in the Holy Ghost, and the least of them is speaking in tongues. So that means if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, wait a minute. I thought I got the, the Holy Spirit when I, when I accepted Jesus. Yes, you did. But you didn't get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced with speaking in tongues. No speaking in tongues, then you don't have the baptism. You have the Holy Ghost, but you don't have the baptism. <coughs> and then the fire, <coughs> excuse, me, the, <coughs> excuse me, the fire, hold on. is when Jesus blows that morning star down and as it hits us out of our belly flows rivers of living water and in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last or the seventh trump, all of a sudden, boom, flame on and you got a glorified body. You are already in eternity just that fast. Never seen again, never hunger again, never thirst again. The sun doesn't light on any or any heat for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, lead them, live in fountains of water. God swept wild tears from their eyes. Who now, whose fan is in his hand? What's he saying? He's saying this. How do I, 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 how do I demonstrate this? Okay, so when <clears throat> it's harvest time, they go out and they, they gather. How do I, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me show you here. There you go. They gather the, the wheat into groups. You can't see this. There you go. You gather like this wheat, and then they cut off that wheat. You can't see. It's, okay, boom. They cut off that wheat. That's a shock of wheat. They stand that up, and then they let that dry out. Then they come along and gather all of those shocks of wheat and put them into big piles. And then they take flails, which is, um, here we go, like this. Okay. Try to imagine two pieces of wood that are tied together in the center with a chain or a rope or leather or something like that. And then as you swing it, this one part comes over and hits. But the, the, the stick that you're holding doesn't vibrate. It doesn't, okay. Instead, you can beat that wheat. That is the, the, the beating of the wheat, or you'd say the tribulation or the testing, that we all have to go through. And that separates the stalk from the leaf and from the, the wheat germ or the wheat seed or the wheat berry itself. Get my terminology right here. So then, now they have a big pile of loose leaves and sticks and wheat and everything. Got to separate them. So they take big, uh, like, pans and they throw the wheat up into the air. And the air, if the wind is blowing, then that wind carries through. You can't see me there. It carries through and it, it removes the wood, the hay, the stubble, and then the heavy wheat falls back down. But if the wind is not blowing, then they have to, you know, like fan it, okay? Not a real good example, but they fan it to separate the wood, the, the wood, hay, this, the, the, this chaff, uh, all the things they don't wait want so that just the wheat falls back down. So when he says that, let me jump back here. <clears throat> There's probably a fast way to do this. I just haven't looked up how to do it. 
there and there. Here we go. <sighs> Whose fan is in his hand. He's saying that Jesus is coming not to water baptize Jesus, never baptize anybody in the water. Jesus' baptism is the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues and with fire. The fire is on the Feast of Trumpets when he returned. And he says his fan is in his hand, meaning he, at this time, John was told to tell him, he is ready to return right now. And ever since then, he has been ready to return. So his fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with un unquenchable fire. What's he saying? He's saying that when Jesus returns, he blows his morning star glory, his light down. Goes. I've talked about this many times. It goes to the center of the earth, sets the foundations of the mountains on fire. The channels of the sea are seen. The hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The hills melt like water running down a steep place. Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. And just that quick, and it's all in the same move. Boom. As we get our glorified body, all of the, the wheat, excuse me, the the uh, the wood, the hay, the stubble, all of the works that are need to be burned up, all of the burning that needs to be done is all done. done. All sin is removed from the earth just that quick. Like I had somebody come up to me and say, Stan, okay, so if the morning star burns up a person, they fall to the ground, a pile of ashes and bones, how is it that the blood rises to the horse bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs? I said, yes, I know. You do You do know I have the answer. And he said, probably. <laughs> and I said, well, along with Jesus, there's two angels that return with sharp sickles. They slash the grapes. And that's the reason the blood rises to the horse bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. Okay, so what's the difference between the wheat and the grapes? Well, that's a very good question. The people that go to church and sit in the pews, some of them are there right now, sit in the pews, they look like the wheat, they act like the wheat, they sound like the wheat, they come to the fellowship dinners, but they don't really believe, or they fall away and they take the mark of the beast. They become tares. Now, if you talk to a wheat farmer, they will tell you that these days, you know, tear is not a problem because they've got chemicals they put down to take care of that. But in the olden days, what they would have to do is wait until the harvest. Now, when the wheat was ripe, the head grows up. Put it over here so you can see. The head grows up like this, and then it has wheat kernels or, or berries on it, they call it. So it has fruit, it's bent over. But the tear has very, very small seeds, not big, heavy seeds like wheat. And so they stand up, they stand up straight, just like this. And so what the farmer would do is walk into the wheat field, and he, at the, at the time of harvest, he could easily see who the tares are. So he just walks through it, he picks up all of the tares, binds them into a bun big bundle before anything else. He throws them into the fire. That's the wheat to into the garden, burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire right here. That's what it's talking. It's a perfect example of wheat. And, and in the Bible, Christians are the wheat. The Jews are barley. And it's a, it's a perfect example of people in the end times. All right, so let's go on. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized. But John forbade him, saying, No, 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 no. I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, or in other words, then he went along with Jesus. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It was not a dove. He just said he saw the Spirit ascending. He saw it coming down like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying to them, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. All right, let's check and see. I don't have any other questions, so let's move on. Chapter 4, how are we doing on time? About halfway. Then Jesus was led up, uh, up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hundred. Notice 
that while he was fasting, he wasn't hungry. And of course, you, many of you are members of either Fast Track or Fast Gap, where we ask you to fast with us Tuesday evening, midnight till Wednesday afternoon at 4 p.m. And uh, I guess we're coming up on a thousand weeks with the Fast Track team where we have fasted. So Fast Track team has done a lot of fasting. As a matter of fact, here just recently for the Honduras trip, we fasted three straight days. And I told Leslie, I said, this is the easiest fast I ever had. Normally I'll get cold or something like that. I didn't even get cold. And I absolutely had no hunger. I mean, it was I had no interest in food. People say, well, if you're fasting, do you still want to go to dinner with us? Sure. Doesn't bother me. I sit there and write, have food, eat, eat right in front of me. It doesn't bother me. I don't get hungry because I'm fasting. It's a higher purpose. Okay, fasted 40 days, 40 nights, he was afterward hungry, meaning it's time to end the fast. When the tempter, came, when the tempter Satan, when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command, command these stones to be made bread. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, why didn't Jesus answer him in the vernacular of the common man. Because there's no power in what we say. Jesus was quoting the word of God, which has power. So when the devil comes to you, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, use the word on him, because the word has power. We don't have any power. It's the word that has power. <clears throat> okay, I saw a question jump up. Uh, yes, I was still drinking water. I've only fasted with no water one time. I went 50 hours as I was falling asleep. Uh, like it came to me, Stan, you need some water. Because if you don't get water, next thing you're going to hear is a trumpet blowing. In other words, I would die in my sleep. So I found my limit, 50 hours, no water. And it didn't wasn't difficult. It's just that I guess my body, body needs lots of water. So anyway, I went out and drank me a glass of water and woke up the next morning. Uh, I know that Massey, Pastor Massey, does a lot of fasting with no water, but I found my limit. Anyway, I, the, only, the only time I would fast with no food and no water was when it was in an emergency. I had to have an answer really fast. Then I would fast no food or water, but I would be very, very careful about going to sleep like that. I mean, you can hurt yourself fasting, okay? Don't hurt yourself. Okay, let's see. Okay, verse uh, verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. He's quoting from um, Psalm 91. Jesus said in again, it is written, sees you the word of God against him. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taken him up to an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said in him, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Now, the devil was lying, but that is what he does. He is the liar and the author of it. Okay. Jesus said to him, get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what's going on? So Jesus just came up out of the water, and boom, the clock started ticking on his ministry. That's, we, that's the reason it's saying from that time on, 
he began to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren called Peter. And Simon Peter called, let me back up, saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. I think it's very interesting that Jesus didn't have to explain who he was. They didn't have to see a miracle. It's just that all of a sudden God spoke to their hearts, do this, and they did it. Simple as that. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I just recently did a study. I think it was the last sermon I did. You know, the reason, if you go through and study them, the reason God sent miracles and the reason the devil sends miracles are exactly the same. Jesus sends miracles to prove the word of God, to prove the word of Jesus, to prove Jesus' word. The devil sends miracles to prove the Antichrist. So miracles are not given to build a church, to build a ministry, to build a name, to get people, or even to heal people. I know, the reader, I mean, I, I did a long study on it. Miracles are to prove the word of God or the power of God or to deceive people to worship the Antichrist. That's the only two things. So when he is healing all manner of disease among the people, he's doing so to bring attention to himself so he can point them to eternal life. Period. That's it. And his fame went through all Syria. And they brought in him all the sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed by, with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had palsy and he healed them. Okay, this is the second time I've been nudged to tell you this story. <clears throat> so if I can tell it without crying. The morning, this past Saturday morning at about 10 o'clock I was with a pastor and two no one one interpreter one interpreter and we were walking we, we would drive down this road and they pulled over and we'd walk up this little trail up the side of really a ravine on this is really just along the side of the road up to these houses. I, I say houses, but what I saw was it was really kind of a mud shack. And I remember looking that there were flying ants because just the night before when I was speaking in another church, I got bit right there. I can still feel it by a flying ant as I'm speaking. And I reached up and grabbed the flying ant and threw it off of me and just kept on talking. I saw these flying ants, and I'm going to say that there were at least 30 of them along this wall that was about eight foot wide, and it was wood, wood up and down, and then wood like kind of sideways like that, packed with mud, and the whole wall was about, if you can see my hands, about that thick. And there was probably 30 or 40 of these flying ants that had made their home in that wall. And we walked up and we were praying for people. And I've got pictures, which I'm not prepared to show you right now. We prayed for that family. Then we walked on over and we prayed for another family. There was a mom and a dad and four children. And <clears throat> sometimes the Lord uses me in personal prophecy. Nowhere near as powerful or as strong as he does with Leslie, by the way. But there was a little girl about nine years old and she was sitting down and she had her legs crossed, you know, like that. Yeah, you know, like that. I couldn't see her back leg. And so I walked up and the Lord spoke to my heart, which I told her. And I reached down and I touched her legs. And I said, the Lord's going to use your legs. 
your legs are going to take the gospel to many people. And I don't remember the rest of, this, of, of what I said. And then a prophet, the Lord just touched me. All right, so so he, he used me to to prophesy to that girl and then to her brother and to her other older brother. And I don't remember all the prophecies. I used to try to remember them, but no, no, that's where I don't try to remember them anymore. Anyway, so I got done praying for those people, and then the pastor turned around and he said, look at this. And he pulled up his cell phone, and he had a picture of him walking over, and she was in a wheelchair. This little nine-year-old girl was in a wheelchair. And he walked over and prayed for her, and he wrapped his arm around her and physically pulled her up out of the wheelchair and started holding her and making her walk along. And by that time, the interpreter said, and a steel pin fell out of her knee. It was inside her knee. Fell out of her knee onto the ground as they're walking along, and she was healed. And now she can walk perfectly. And I went, well, thank you, Lord. Okay, that told me that, yeah, I got that right. I really did hear from the Lord. That's not the end of the story. So then we walked on down probably 20 paces to the next house. And there was an old man and an old woman. And then there was a really old guy. And they said, well, would you pray for him? He's their uncle and uh, he's got something in his chest wrong. And... So I started to lay hands on him, and I, I turned around. The little girl in the red dress with the leg thing is standing beside me. And the Lord spoke to my heart again. Have her pray for her uncle. So I turned to her, and I said, you're here because the Lord spoke to your heart to come. Of course, the interpreter interpreted, yes. I said, okay. So this is what he directed me to do. I said, come here. You're going to pray for your uncle. So I stepped over in front of her uncle, took her hand, put her hand upon his shoulder, and I said, now, here's what you say. And I told her what to say and everything in Jesus' name. And then we got done praying for her uncle, and she turned back, and the Lord spoke to me. And I saw her in a vision. I said, I see you in a white dress. What I saw was like, like a Catherine Kuhlman, if you know that name. Okay, I saw her in a white dress standing up in front of a sea of people. And I said, the, the Lord is going to use you and your legs because she was in some kind of an accident. She was crippled for life. And now here she is walking. He's going to use you and your legs to win a lot of people to the Lord. And that's the point of it. In other words, the miracles are not just to heal people. Miracles are to point people to Jesus. He just touched me again, confirming what I'm saying and confirming that I was supposed to tell you that story. So anyway, um, miracles are very close. And he's going to use these miracles to point a lot of people to Jesus. And if you want to be part of pointing people to Jesus, wow, okay, I'm going to reveal a secret here. May 17 to 19, we're going to have another crusade. May 17 to 19. And I believe that there's a strong possibility that by May 17 to 19, America will be in a world of hurt and judgment will have hit and sevenfold miracles will be flying left and right. And it'll be a time. Now, I, I do not have to say it the Lord. I'm just telling us what I feel. So we will see. We will see. Maybe maybe God will confirm that to me. Okay, let's see. Where were we? Let me back up. 23. Jesus went into all Galilee, teaching their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. In other words, the healings were to point to Jesus and the gospel. His fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought in him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which, which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had palsy, and he healed them. Healings are to point to the gospel and to Jesus, period. And there followed him great multitudes of people. Why? 
for the healings. That was the point, to get them to believe in him. Great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Chapter 5. And seeing the multitude, he went up to a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and here's the great Beatitudes, the, some of the greatest words in the Bible. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice it did not say poor. The poor aren't blessed. <laughs> what he's saying, the poor in spirit. And I don't think that that means that they don't have spirit. It means that they are in this life hurting. And over the last 10 days in Honduras, I cannot tell you how many times I was crying inside. I couldn't cry on the outside because these people were miserable. They were hurting. I couldn't show, I, I couldn't show my tears. It was not the thing to do. They wouldn't have understood. But I was crying inside. I was crying for people that are miserable. I saw so many people that love Jesus. I mean, they love Jesus. They have their Bibles. They know their Bibles probably better than most American Christians. And they are, you know, it's Jesus is all they have to hang on to. He's the only source of encouragement. He's the only thing they can look up to. And so here in America, you know, we got football, we got baseball, we got basketball, we got American Idol, you know, foolishness like that. We got things to entertain us. They don't. There, matter of fact, I was there 10 days. And I said, you know, I've lived in my house for 18 years, and I think the electricity has probably gone off less than 10 times. And I said, it looks like I'm going to be in Honduras 10 days, and it looks like the electricity is going to go off 10 times in 10 days. We weren't there 30 minutes. Electricity went off. Two hours. It just goes off to any particular time. Matter of fact, I'll tell you another story. So we were at a, an outside basketball court. It was covered, but it was old, concrete, was, had a lot of cracks in it, and they had these two old rusty, I think you call them basketball goals and backboards up there. And uh, we had gone there the day before and staked it and prayed over it and anointed it, and we were kind of having a mini crusade there. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there was at least 300 that most people I think were saying there's more like 500 people there that night. And uh, I got there late because I had been getting interviewed on a TV station promoting the whole thing. So they drove me up there and I probably wasn't there 10 minutes. And when I arrived, they were already in praise and worship. And it was already after dark and the electricity went off. They didn't even blink. That music didn't stop. The songs, the singing didn't stop. That praise and worship leader just belted it out louder because they all knew the song. They didn't need words. They didn't need music. I mean, every, all the music stopped, but the praise and worship didn't stop. And it continued on. And about the time praise and worship was over, I would say at least 20, probably closer to 30 minutes, then the electricity came on just in time for us to have our electric mics again so the, all the people could hear us. But I, I, I was very curious because I thought, you know, in America, if electricity gone off, praise worship, probably the whole service would have been over. Everybody just said, well, you know, let's do it another time. We'd have left. We're not resilient like that. These people know how to grab the heartstrings of God. They know how to praise and work. I'll tell you another story. We were in the upper room. <laughs> when we first got there, we had the whole Sunday morning service and the air conditioners were off. You haven't lived until you've been in, oh, I don't know, maybe it was 85. Might have been, might, maybe, I, I guess maybe it was 90 that day. But inside, you know, it was a lot hotter. But 72 degrees at 100% humidity is hot and sweaty. You go up to hug, hug people, and it's like, uh, uh, but you can't do that, you see. Or you go up and pat someone on the back, and it's like, yeah, 
Yeah, because it's all sweaty. Everybody's sweaty. Everybody is sweaty. But it's probably 90 degrees outside and, I don't know, probably 100, 110. These people stayed. Electricity went off in there, too. They stayed. They didn't have any words. They didn't have any projector. They had uh, one guy. Well, of course, on Sunday morning, they had they had a piano, they had drums, and they had two microphones and people singing. But when the electricity went off, they just kept right on going. But the next morning, we had the ladies come in. I counted them. There were 97 ladies in there. And these ladies walked in, and they were loaded for bear. I mean, when the praise and worship started, they didn't have any words. They didn't need any words. They didn't need a praise and worship singer. Probably they didn't need the piano playing. But there's only one guy singing behind a microphone and a piano. They sang loud. They they praised the Lord. I I mean, my eyes went like this. I turned to Leslie. <laughs> she was she would look at me at the same time. I said, Are you serious? So we turned around, we watched and looked into the faces of 97 women in Honduras that were singing their heart out, man. I mean, nobody had to tell them, sing loud. Nobody had to. It was loud. And they were praising the Lord. They were worshiping, man. I mean, I told Leslie, that they dust us. <laughs> they dust us Americans. There, I've never seen any group of people praise and worship like that. Great multitudes of people from Galilee, Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea and beyond Jordan. Miracles drew them together. As I, I've told you many times, August 8th, 2015, Saturday night, Lord, what do I say for the sermon tomorrow morning? And I heard words. And I said, when the judgment hits, or as the judgment, let me say it exactly, as the judgment hits, so will my miracles. Miracles like no one has seen going back to Adam and Eve. You tell them, I will never leave them nor forsake them. And as the devil shows up, I'm going to meet him. Inch for inch, step for step, pound for pound, everything the devil does, I'm going to meet him. So my guess is that we're probably going to see a Palestinian state in the early part of 2024. I said guess. My guess is that that's probably when Leslie's prophecies start coming to pass, Omar ushers in Palestinian state. Catastrophe hits America, uh, hits, hits America. That's probably the New Madrid Fault earthquake from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, splitting America because we split Israel. Consequently, that would be the judgment. And then great miracles start all across America. And it's time for you and I to go to work. See, we're here in this Bible study tonight preparing. Even if these are not exactly the scriptures that we'll be using at the time, what happens is the Bible gets in here. The Bible gets in our heart and it starts changing us. It starts making changes in us. I saw the difference between churches where they were, you know, sort of knew their Bible versus those that really knew their Bible. Those that really, there was, we're, we're trying to figure out whether I've spoken actually four or five churches, but I know that there was like one that was kind of lukewarm and they were kind of lukewarm in their Bible. But the ones where the anointing was powerfully and powerful and strong, there was three of those for sure. They knew their Bible. Man, the anointing was strong in there, strong. Well, when the judgment hits, that's when Americans are going to finally, not just Americans, but around the world. It's not just an American revival. It's a worldwide revival where God is giving people an opportunity to receive his gift before even greater trouble hits. All right, so let's go back to this. Let me see where I'm at. 20 minutes. Okay, we'll try to get through this. Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went upon a mountain, and he was set. His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they should be comforted. Now, it's not saying we should be mourning. He's saying that if things in life just are that hard for you, in eternity you will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek there is not saying weak. 
he's saying for the people that lack confidence in themselves, he says, God is going to turn those things around. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Meaning, in eternity, there will be righteousness, no more sin. That's the reason rule with the rod of iron, because if anybody sins, a morning star judge hits them with a morning star. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. No spot, no wrinkle, no sin. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember the scripture where it says that, uh, bless, how's it worded? When they shall revile you and say, all manner, all manner of evil against you for my sake, blessed are you. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Blessed are ye when men revile, well, there it is, the very next scripture, and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, you are the salt and light. Okay, it doesn't take much salt to make the meal taste a whole lot better. And it doesn't take too many Christians to start changing a society all around. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt had lost its savor, Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Meaning, if the Christians are not spreading the gospel, if they're not spreading the righteousness, if they're not calling other people to be righteous, then they're worth nothing to be tossed under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city, and I believe this is talking about America, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Meaning America was the nation set on a hill that was to take the gospel to the world, but now she's fallen away. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of the devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean, hateful bird. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. What's that saying? Well, in the millennium, there will be one mountain and only one mountain on the earth, and on top of that mountain will be the New Jerusalem, and on the top of that Jerusalem, that New Jerusalem, will be Jesus. He literally will be the light of the world for all eternity. The sun, the moon, and the stars, all gone. All dissolved. I just read the other scriptures again the other day. All the sun, moon, stars, they're all gone. Why? Because there's nothing to compete with Jesus. That's what it's saying. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. So he's saying that the new Jerusalem will be on a candlestick or the one single mountain on earth. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, read it again, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. What is a jot and a tittle? Well, in Hebrew, they don't have vowels. It's all consonants. But in order to help some of the people that are not familiar with Hebrew, they would put little dots or little dashes. Those are referred to as the jots and the tittles. In other words, everything written in the scriptures will come to pass. Not one little thing will miss. Everything will come to pass. No mistakes. Perfect. Whomsoever shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, it's important that we attend a Bible study, and it's important that we teach others what is in the Bible, and will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, that shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, or we would say, you know, some kind of a bad word, 
shall be in danger of counsel. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Meaning, watch what comes out of our mouth. Watch that we are not sending curses. Because as you sow, so also shall you reap. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thou, brother, hast aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee unto the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt no, by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. In other words, every red cent. He's saying, Get along with your fellow brothers and sisters. You have heard that it was said by them of the old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. In other words, like at the crusade, Leslie had a word of knowledge that was a lot of people caught up in alcoholism. And ask everybody called, caught up in alcoholism to come up for prayer. And so I was praying for people. A lot of people prayed for to cast out the devil of our, our alcoholism. So if you haven't tasted alcohol, don't. If you haven't taken a puff, don't. If you haven't committed adultery, don't. It's a lot better to, it's a lot easier to avoid it than it is to step in it and try to clean it off your shoe. You know what I mean? And if thy right, eye, right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him put away her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, commits adultery. Now, I've had people come up to me and say, Stan, you and Leslie have both been married before. What are you doing in the ministry? And I simply say, well, the blood of Jesus can wash those sins away too. So be careful. Be careful. Maybe that's said enough. Again, you've heard that it has been said of them of old time, that thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication simply be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. In those days, they used to say, oh, I swear I will do it, or I, you can cut my hand off. Okay, what he's saying is don't do that. Just yes or no. That's all that's needed. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will serve thee at law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, and turn not away. Better read that last one again. To him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Means that when people ask us for help, we should help them. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, Turn not thou away. If you can help, help. Ye have heard it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, and bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, 
and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and send his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not do the publicans the same. But And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than the others? Do not even the publicans so? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Okay, so we're going to stop there, I think. Yeah, we're nine minutes away. So <clears throat> we'll stop at Matthew chapter 6, and we may, I say may, may take it up from there next week. Okay, so... Jesus is challenging us to walk with him. And it's easy to read, but it's not easy to follow. You say it's, you know, you, you talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? And I don't think anybody is able to walk the walk. Obviously not. But we Christians are at least committed to do our best to do so. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for allowing us all to serve. And Lord, I ask you to speak to the hearts of all of the people, be they live or be they watching a recording. I ask you right now to speak to their hearts. They may not feel the anointing touch. They may not even know for certain you're speaking to them. But I ask you to speak to their hearts. First, I ask that you make certain that their name is in the book of life. If they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, get them so. And call them into your service of soul winning. Get them to be ready to be used in great and mighty miracles. Get them ready to be used in all of the things that are soon to hit the earth. Help them to be strong and to stand when others fall. Help them to understand the scriptures. I ask you to give them the spirit of prophecy so they can understand the scriptures, the spirit of soul winning. Speak to them. Show them who to witness to. Give them the words to say. And let them all hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I'll end it a couple of minutes early tonight. God bless you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for your support. And uh, Spirit of Prophecy, or excuse me, um, Secret Door to Understand Bible Prophecy is available at prophecyclub.com.